As the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture nears the end of hearing witness testimony in June, one of the whistleblowers whose courage blazed the trail for what the Commission has managed to uncover is finally ready to share her personal journey. She invited Masake Kana into her home. I wrote this book to tell my story, to reveal the effects of state capture on ordinary people, to draw attention to the role of the whistleblower and the danger and devastation we face. South Africa, 2015. In high places, there were many dark secrets. State-owned enterprises were the target of state capture networks, but the true picture was still hidden. Musilo Motepo had just joined Regiments, a financial advisory firm. Enticed by director Eric Wood, who asked her to lead a big ESCOM project. So for me, it was very exciting. I mean, he gave me a blank check and said, can we afford you? How much do you want? Sign on bonus. And I happily went. These were once the officers of regiments. They were rich and riding the wave, shaking down the SOEs, writes Motepo, as they extracted massive fees from state-owned companies. They were making a lot of money. Plus, Eric loved fast cars. He had uh, Austin Martin, he had Porsches, he had a helicopter, he had a farm. As a financial advisory, regiments would structure loans. If, for example, ESCOM needed billions to complete Kusile and Mudubi, or when Transnet wanted to buy new locomotives, or SA Express needed finance. They also said they could help the state-owned companies cut costs. If you had to, off the top of your head, quantify exactly how much was given to regiments and later Trillion for consulting, what do you think it would be? So I would probably say two to three billion. Of South African taxpayers' money? Yes, with nothing to show. It's just advice. Motepo has finance degrees and her career was her life. She bought her own Santon home, she worked long hours, and often shared an early morning coffee with her boss, Eric Wood. One Monday morning, the 26th of October, 2015, he's wearing a three-piece suit, and he, he looks like the cat that got all the cream. He's so happy and excited. And then he says to me, the president is going to fire and land Sure. So for me, the, the, the former president, well, he always did a lot of midnight reshuffle. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't even understand the significance of this. Why are you telling me about a reshuffle? Six weeks later, former President Zuma did fire Nene. In came the unknown Des Van Rooyen. Markets tumbled. I think we lost 500 billion. That's in your equity, your pension, your bonds. It, it was devastating. The currency was gone, the, the bond markets, the equity markets. The original plan was to have a minister like Des Van Roy. Yes, pliable. Yes. That's what Eric said. The reason why Nene had to go was he was not approving the nuclear deal and there were certain transactions that they were putting to the state-owned companies that the minister was not approving. And this new minister will be more pliable and agreeable to these transactions. But around the same time, boardroom battles at regiments led to a split. Eric Wood left to start Trillion with the man known as the fourth Gupta brother, Salim Essa. Amabongan and Susan Comrie investigated both companies. Susan, how significant of a role did regiments and Trillion play in state capture? I mean, they were absolutely crucial. We, we had described regiments at one point as the sort of Trojan horse that had allowed the Guptas to come into various state-owned entities. You know, very often these the, the companies that the Guptas were using to extract, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of rands from state-owned entities, they were really just sort of letterboxes. So they really needed uh, some kind of a credible front, and that credible front on a lot of those transactions uh, became regiments and then later trillion. Motepo went with Eric Wood as the new CEO of Trillion. ESCOM's top bosses were now her clients. Eric Wood was taking you everywhere. What was that like? It was intoxicating. It was like having a seat at the table. And not even you asked to, be, to lean in. You were, you were saying, this is my new CEO. Mm. And they were like, oh, you, you take transformation seriously. 
and to be in the forefront of these um, industry leaders who I thought at the time were taking South Africa's economy forward. Within months, though, Mutebo began to realize she was being played. It was grooming and fronting. So in theory, you were the CEO, but oh, the there were these three white guys yes. and Salim Issa running the show. Exactly. And to make it worse, I was a director. So I, I had to now comply with the Companies Act. I felt that I was just there to look black and female and to be paraded around. And that was very, very disempowering. And her big bonuses began to make sense. In my book, there's a specific chill that goes down my spine when I remember this conversation. And Eric said to me, be loyal to me and I'll reward you. So he had outpriced me on, out of the market. And my bonuses were the types that used to pay off mortgages. And buy designer handbags. So this is the Eric Wood this bag. This is the grooming bag. I think it signifies that stage in my life where I was his blue-eyed wonder and uh, I was going to Paris on a conference and he gave me such a wonderful, huge stipend. So I think this bag is the beginning of, of, of the many other stories of bags that you will see in my book. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them has a meaning. In the book, you describe Eric as the mastermind architect and enabler of the grandest looting and state capture imaginable. That's 100%. She wanted us to meet at her home to show carte blanche that whistleblowers are just ordinary people. I just wanted to show South Africa that we are not extraordinary. We are vain. We have um, guilty pleasures. We're not vegetarian, vegans, hugging trees. No, you just have to have the courage. And courage comes from all areas of life. Eric Wood declined to comment on any of these allegations. As 2016 unfolded, the Guptas seemed unstoppable, and Amabongani connected the dots in a Mail and Guardian expose. Wow, that was the day I realized that I was part of something very evil. And it had various players within the state-owned companies, but I, I realized I can actually fill in the blanks. Also trying to fill in the blanks was former public protector Tuli Madonsela, who was in a race against time to complete her state of capture report before her term ended. Motepo knew she could fill in the gaps and really help Tuli Madonsela with her state of capture report. And she had a trail of hard evidence. And I finally saw her terms of reference. And I saw I could help her on 80% of these things. I had a, a, a moment of introspective, like, who are you? And I said, no, I'm not a minister. Somebody else will tell her, not me. I don't have protection. I remembered a, a verse, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good women or men to do nothing. And I said, God, give me the strength. I have to be a good woman. On holiday in Egypt, at a monastery in the desert, she made the decision to tell Tuli Madonsela what she knew. I felt very spiritual because I felt so broken and lost. And so it was, for me, it was, I was like re reconnecting with God. The point at which she came forward to the public protector, it was so crucial. Her timing was so, so, so important. There was a lot of fear and suspicion that state capture was happening, but very few people had actually been able to sort of put the proof out there. And Masilo comes along and she's the person who was in the room. And not just for Nene Gate, she was in the room, had seen what was happening at Regiments and then at Trillium. Motepo wanted to remain anonymous, but when her CCMA statement was leaked, Eric Wood charged her criminally. You say Eric Wood went into the Stalingrad approach. What did he do? According to the Trillion Leaks, he spent 18 million rand on me. Sure. Fighting Stalingrad, every street, every corner, every house, every room. It was the nine criminal charges. Cyber crime, that was my favorite. <laughs> yeah, cyber crime because I forwarded some of my emails to my Gmail account. That would later become crucial evidence. Yes that the public protector and um, 
the Zondo Commission is relying on. She tried to get a job, but corporate South Africa turned their back on her. People doubting my integrity. Jokes like, we need three references, just don't uh, ask the Gupta brothers. With no job and a legal bill north of a million rand, she was about to lose everything she had worked for. I felt like I was fighting alone. And this home of yours that we sit in now became your sort of a wilderness and you isolated here. Completely. I lived in my bedroom. I lived in my bedroom for two years. But then the first of her angels, she says, showed up. It was French human rights advocate William Bourdon who founded the platform to protect whistleblowers in Africa. They settled her legal bill. And you have this organization who support Edward Snowden and Julian Assange fly and come and say, we've just opened an office and you're the first African whistleblower. And, and I said to God, now I have euros, endless euros and, you know, they, let's go. David, David and Goliath, let's go. Many times she felt she was living someone else's life. Like the day she visited the American embassy, not to get a visa, but to meet with the FBI. I'm pinching myself once again, and I'm asking, when I'm a sort of, when saying who FBI babat la born, as in, sort of girl, what have you done that the Federal the whole Bureau FBI, of yeah. Investigations wants to see you? But I'm, I'm happy that uh, my testimony, um, it, it gave way for a sanction list, uh, so that any, all the Guptas and the associates they have been banned from doing any business with American corporates and banks. It was only after the leadership changed at the Hawks and the NPA that finally all charges against her were dropped. But Mutepo was still without an income. By that time, I was angry with God. You had exited the God WhatsApp group, yes, as you put it in your yes. book. I said, you have forsaken me. You have completely forsaken me. I have stopped even applying for jobs. I was completely hopeless. And out of, a, out of the blue, angels start coming. He was an angel South Africans knew well. Then deputy editor of the financial mail, Sikonati Manjanja, who had exposed ESCOM corruption. He didn't know her, but he gave her a call anyway. And, and she was now just about to become homeless and nobody was doing a thing about it. So, he wrote an opinion piece, The Cost of Being Principled. Soon afterwards, former MTN CEO Rob Shooter offered her a job. One of your angels, Sikonati, had it not been for that piece that he wrote, things wouldn't have gone the way they did. No, absolutely not. Um, that is when I had to, with my tail between my legs, apply to rejoin the God's WhatsApp group. <laughs> but she still had a long way to go. After a nervous breakdown, it was her faith, her mom, and intense counseling that eventually led to her recovery. When I look back now, I see Trillion, their strategy was to burn me, to burn me with defamation, assassination of character, with bankrupting me. But what they forgot is that fire has two properties. Fire is painful because it's removing the chaff, the impurities, your pride. I'm not a CEO anymore. Who am I? And then what they didn't bargain for was that I wasn't going to burn, but I'd come out stronger and ready to take on the world. Finally, almost five years after leaving Trillion, she gave her testimony to the Zondo Commission and appealed to it to relook at our treatment of whistleblowers. There were times I prayed for death and peace, times I could have cracked. And when I thought I would, but I didn't, I kept my faith and I made it through. I fought hard and refused to let them take my mental and physical health from me. If you have faith and you stay in your course, you will triumph. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.